Uh, hi, I'm Van Bugstad, CEO of Coho. Um, I've been really excited about this particular session. Um, what design means in co-living is often very misunderstood. Uh, it's not uncommon to see a very traditional HMO painted with vibrant colours and called co-living. We've all seen that many times. But design definitely goes deeper than this. Those involved in co-living will know this panel are leading the design and need no introduction. That said, this session has had a lot of interest from all areas of the industry. So to start with, I'd like to ask each of you just to say a little bit about yourself. So Stuart, do you want to start off? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm, uh, I'm an ex-product design entrepreneur. So I've built and sold a number of uh, product innovation companies. I've spent most of my life in in product and marketing and brand. I'm a co-living developer and an operator. So we do the operations side, we do the development side, but we also have our own agency to do the operations side. I've been building a co-living portfolio and co-working portfolio in the Southeast since 2015. And we've got a mixture of co-living, commercial, hotels, and single lets. That's great. Um, Julian, do you want to go next? Yeah, okay. I guess I would class myself a bit like an inter in interior designer. Uh, I teach people interior design, uh, mainly property investors. Um, I started investing in property probably about seven years ago. I've got a small portfolio around me that I use to supplement my income. And I love the design work. So I, my big thing has been work-life balance. So for me, investing in property has been to establish a good work-life balance for myself. Um, so that's where I'm coming from, really. So design and portfolio, but mainly I'd call them boutique HMOs. And uh, Luke? Uh, yeah, my name's Luke Spikes. I've been um, uh, at this game relatively, in a relatively short period window, three years, but prior to that, 35 years building businesses. And what I'm effectively seeking to do is to transfer my business experience and knowledge over into creating wonderful places for people to live. I mean, that's fundamentally what we're all about. But the very sharp focus for the time being is on two things, uh, co-living, which is creating design-led, community-centred, art-filled, shared homes for young professionals. And on the other side, uh, uh, hoping to help regenerate high streets by purchasing buildings that we're turning into, retail buildings that we're turning into a mix of a part hotel in the offices and uh, co-working locations in the, in, in the retail spaces. And that's now our very sh sharp focus as we, as we roll uh, from, from, from here on in. And uh, last but not least, Tom. Hi, yeah, my name is Tom Sherry. Um, with my wife, Philippa, we run, uh, we founded a company called Fat Properties, which is um, focused on uh, developing um, student and professional co-living, um, all designed to improve uh, well-being. And that's our kind of big focus, which really just means quality of life. Um, we've been doing it since uh, for about the past seven years um, directly. Um, like Stuart, we both develop and we operate. Um, we have a, a kind of operations company as well, um, which I think is, is helpful because it gives you that full feedback loop. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's our focus. Brilliant. Um, okay, so firstly, if anyone watching has any questions, please put them in the session as it goes on. I'll pick them up and we'll answer at the end if we've got time. Um, so I'd like to begin by going back to the point um, I made at the start. Often high-end HMO is considered co-living by people who maybe don't know as much, which is generally a reflection of the perceived design. Um, but how is designing for co-living different than designing just an HMO? And I think to start that off, I think, Stuart, do you want to give your thoughts? Um, yeah. So, I mean, the HMO has been around for a long time. The terminology has been there for a long time. You know, the product was always going to revolt, evolve, just as bedsits. Bedsits have evolved over the years. Different products have evolved. So the HMO is always going to evolve from the professional one. So I think co-living is more about the overall experience. On one hand, you've got the product. The product has changed, the technology's changed. You know, it's not just the interiors and the space that's there, but you've got the usability of the space, you know, actually what you're doing, how you're forming it, what 
what facilities you're putting in there, whether that's co-working, whether that's hot desking, whether that's cinema rooms, whether that's new technology that didn't exist before in the market. All of those things have kind of gone into the mix with just the product. But I'd say that the, the bigger part of co-living is the experience. And that's where you start to move into operations where you've got, for example, the community, uh, the community events, plus you've got the, the, the brand experience. So the entire brand experience end to end from thinking about moving in to actually living in there, having any issues, building the community and then moving out. Now, two thirds of that is operations and only one third is the product you live in there. So co-living is quite broad now and the market's changed a lot very recently. So there's been a focus on the products, but I think as we move further in the next kind of like five years, I think we're going to be shifting more into uh, a focus on the experience side of things because that's where you're going to really differentiate yourself in the market. And um, Tom, you've uh, you've got the book behind you, designed for well-being, that you and your wife. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything you said, Stuart, and, and I think um, focusing on the product. In, in fact, the, the whole thing before you even kind of start thinking about the, the literal points of design, I think it comes down to a, an approach. It's a bit like Luke was talking about earlier. You know, the typical HMO is a kind of property investor type product. It's often maybe, you know, individual landlords. <clears throat> and they are thinking, not always, but often, the mindset is about, I want to do something for me. I am going to invest, I'm going to make money, I'm going to give myself a pension, I'm going to do all these things. None of those are bad, um, but they're the primary driver. And I think the, the co-living actually is about, you know, the successful mindset and the successful approach is, I am here to build a business to serve my customers, okay? Now, if I do that well, I'm going to do well financially, I'm going to do it, you know, I'm going to succeed. Like any other business, you know, you, you serve your customers really well, you give them a great product, that's great. Mm -hmm. So I think before anybody even starts thinking about design, you really kind of going to got to make sure that that is your focus, um, because then you know when you get to decision points on, you know, do we spend a little bit more on this? Do we put this, you know, this really good quality provisioning? Do we do we really serve them as best we can? You're going to come down on the right side rather than now I'm going to cut some corners. Um, I'm going to do this, uh, which, which I think is less successful long term. Um, for a developer and I think it's yeah uh, I think that mindset is very important um, Julie, uh, uh, yeah, Julia I think, um, do you want to add so, so the question was do you think co-living means high end that was one of them yeah well so, that's, uh, yeah, that's so, like so my answer to that would be is Ikea high end um, I don't think that um co-living necessarily means high end at all um but i did uh, um uh, ian said about talking about well-being and so on and so forth but to me i think because i operate in i don't operate in the south i operate in the north so i think the market is slightly different you're dealing with cheaper properties and also because i'm a portfolio landlord um i'm looking at ease simplicity really of management i think stuart is talking about when stuart's talking about experience and so on and so forth I think I've I've been living in one of my HMOs for a while, but to be honest with you, the last seven months I've been here, most of my properties I've only been into twice in six months. Um, the, the experience can be bought in in many ways. It, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a, a, a labour intensive job. I just think you have to have a mindset that when you're going into this business, you are doing it for your customers. So you're creating a property that people enjoy living in. And I think if you do that well, um, you, you actually need less management because people, if they're, if they're living in a good communal space, they make friends. Mm. If you choose your tenants right, they make friends with each other and they get on with it. Um, so in answer to the question, is, a, is it high end? No, definitely not. Um, is there any changes in the specification with um, co-living? Well, I've been doing this for 20 years and I started doing uh, student HMOs. And personally, I've just designed all my HMOs according to quality student accommodation with desks and good communal spaces. And I think you just have to have a good attitude towards your customers and design them well enough so that people can get on with things. Um, and that's been my experience. And I've done it for min to minimize management, personally. 
to make them very easy to make, manage. Um, and that's why I've done it. But I don't think it means it's high end. And I don't think the specification needs to change that much. I just think you have to have a proper caring mindset towards your customers and you tend to get it right. I agree. I mean, I think if people are allowed to, sorry, if you give people the opportunity and the space to come <laughs> together, you know, to spend meaningful time together, mm. you know, it doesn't matter if it's fancy or simple or, you know, high end or not high end, whatever exactly that means. People want to be together, spend time together. You can facilitate that uh, and then you can layer on top whatever you want. Um, but that's the foundation. Yes. We're moving towards a more of a service based um, uh, operation because the hotels that we operate, you know, we, we won't rent the hotel. If we don't give a good experience, if we don't, if we don't put the customer first, if we're not customer centric, we're not going to rent the rooms. So co-living is move is moving more towards the hospitality model where it's more service based and these things matter. I, th I think you will, you will inevitably have a whole host of HMO landlords who would say that they are focused on their customer and the service they deliver. And I think one of the key, which which doesn't then need immediately mean that that necessarily is co-living or in fact precludes it from being something else. I, I, I think a lot of folk mis, misunderstand co-living as being um, and design for co-living as being aesthetics, which I think is really the point Julian was making. You know, you, you, it doesn't have to be high end. It does have to focus on the customer in the first instance, and you have to have a problem to solve and a customer to serve. That's how we, we think about it and what I've brought from where I've come from. And, uh, and we have a simple um, uh, a guideline when it comes to how we focus design, and it's four parts, place, space, face, and feel. And so, and only one of those, which is the face, is the aesthetic. The place is, where is it located? It needs to be located near to and adjacent to the things that your target audience wants and needs adjacent or local to them. That doesn't mean it needs to be in the most affluent suburbs of the city, quite, quite the reverse more often than not, uh, but it needs to understand your customer. What is it they need from say transportation and design and locate your, uh, and pick and choose your locations, your place uh, there first. So second is space. One of the things we spend a lot of time doing is reconfiguring properties to better suit the purpose of the audience we're seeking to serve. So, so, and that's a design thing, you know, it really is fundamentally at the heart of what we're seeking to accomplish. How does the space flow? How does the space work? Does that space meet the need of those people who are gonna be living inside that space? So call it function if you want, I suppose. Face, aesthetic, well, that's the, you know, I guess the thing that is most outwardly facing, particularly on social media. You know, we have our own aesthetic, we have our own style, we have our own design, uh, we have our own color palettes. All of those things are important because they contribute to the last part, which is feet, which is face, which is the feel. You know, how, 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 how comfortable, secure, safe do I feel when I enter this property? And that actually is rooted in the way we approach design. It, it really is all about ultimately the atmosphere you create, how positive it is, how people feel living there, because that then leads to them having a more positive experience in their lives generally. So that's co-living. To my mind, that's co-living. When you focus on not just... A, a, a home for people you focus on a place that feels good feels uh, and contributes to them having a more positive existence that's that that's how we view it now ultimately however and i, and I know I might, I might differ slightly from from julian in terms of focus on ease of operation mine is on i want a superior financial performance so i'm not i'm not doing this simply because I'm a nice guy and I want to have people uh, li live and enjoy their lives in the properties we own. I mean, that's, that does drive us, by the way, but that's not the only reason. And for us, it's superior financial performance. All of these things that I've just referred to, if done well, will lead to uh, your customer being delighted to pay you more money for the service that you actually deliver. Ultimately, your operating cost will be lower and as a consequence of that, your margins are wider. So, so whichever side of the fence you sit on, you know, I want to create lovely looking properties. I want, I want, I want to have soft, uh, you know, ephemeral feeling that's good for my customer. Or I want to make money. I think all of these things can be delivered and are not mutually ex mutually exclusive when it comes to co living. And occupancy just, as well. What about occupancy? Because you know. If someone enjoys living in that space and you've moved beyond design into usability and the usability is such that they, act, they enjoy living there, it's easy to live there, 
their long-term occupancy will be increased as part of that, which feeds into your high performance as well, which works. Well, well, I mean, that would be part of what we deem deem performance. And we're we're delighted, I'm pleased to report that we have zero voids, zero percent voids, always have. And and that that is an absolutely a focus for us. And and, And that is because if our product is attractive enough in the marketplace, we will achieve... Um, a customer, of course, moves on. Inevitably, they're young, they're young folk, their jobs change, their circumstances change, and they need to move on. But we have always ensured that once that happens, a room is let prior to uh, that, the expiry of that contract. That's, we've been able to do that. And we focus on that. But you can only do that if your product's good enough. You know, you've mentioned mm-hmm. the word several times to me and Julian. You have the same. You're designing a product that suits the audience you're seeking to serve so that they enjoy it are happy to pay for it and want to stay in it right and stay in it for the long term i mean well i mean you're from what you were saying is that there's two priorities there's the financial priority which obviously we want to make money out of this and from my perspective in the north to be honest with you if i was to go too far i'd be spending i would would be over specifying the product Uh, but for me like you say if people are happy they stay longer i've got one tenant that's been with me seven years one tenant to be with me five years. I think my average stay is about three years. And my first, my basically the, my last two houses, I've still got the same tenants living in them than when I first did them. So I have hardly any churn. Um, and that to me is profit. You know, if you mm-hmm. don't have to worry about people leaving your property, they're well maintained and, they're, and people are happy, then that's very easy, very consistent income. Um, so for me, and I think with mm-hmm. it, maybe all of us here, we do make the extra effort because you just get a much more consistent long term income for that for that effort. That's mm-hmm. the that's the payback. And Steve okay. Jobson tell you stuff like this, you know, um, you know, it's not how it looks. It's important. It's how it works, how it functions. Mm-hmm. And the well-being uh, element is, you know, what's the function of a home? Uh, anyway, that was going to be, a, I was going to bring that up in a minute. So I'll, I'll wait for that one. But yeah, but yeah, I think that was a very good point that, that, that Luke raised there. It's like on one hand, you've got the impact that we're, you know, we're, we're, on a, we're all on our separate missions and we, 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 you know, we've got this wider impact that we want to do with the work we create. But the other side is the developer hat on, and, and that's about creating high performance, high yielding assets and, and, you know, co-living done correctly can provide that high performance for people i think it's a business isn't it i mean you know this is the thing we have to you know re- keep reminding ourselves i mean design is a um, it's one of those sort of it, it, topics misunderstood by many uh, and often in the focus of on the on the look the feel the colors you know all of those sorts of things where actually to me design is fundamentally about the customer you serve and the business you create around servicing that customer and that business has to be profitable you know we have to uh, uh, we have to ensure that we are able to sustain um, you know our investment in our case it's very significant because we are uh, creating very high specification properties. So we, we take a risk in many respects that we won't receive our return on the valuation once we're, you know, once we're done on the other side, you know, and, and uh, as we head up north, as we have invent- inevitably will, um, you know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have to come and speak with you, Julian, about making sure that we don't overdo it because that is clearly a, a, a risk for the business because you spend too, money, too much money. But as I said, it's not about being grabbing, it's about saying, Actually, businesses need to exist to serve their customers first, but also need to serve the business and the stakeholders on the business second. So, do those two things well, you, you on you go, and you have the opportunity to, uh, to 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 keep doing what you do for many years. Hence, I think the um, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, you know, we were talking earlier, Stuart, sure, about um, you know occupancy. You know, the, the past few properties we've purchased have actually been from existing landlords, and the line they give is the market's oversaturated, doesn't work anymore. And we say, okay, great. We'll, we'll purchase it from you, thanks very much. Um, and lo and behold, similar to you, Luke, you know, uh, voids are, um, you know, 99, sorry, our occupancy is 99% plus, let's get those the right way around. Um, you know, again, because it is, you know, look, we're, we're all preaching the same thing, aren't we? It, you know, it's a business, serve your customer, and guess what? Business does very well. 
Uh, and was, uh, case in point, actually, Tom, to go to that very point, we just finished a building, um, uh, completed it in the end of November. Worst time on earth to be uh, bringing um, a brand new property yeah. to market, as we all know. Yeah. As we all know. Yet, um, five rooms were sold before we even took it to market. Two rooms were sold within four days of it coming on the market, and all of those uh, young people moved, are now moved into the uh, into the house. And we broke record rents. We got some record rents on some on on the, on the rooms, and the five people. That, so four of the seven people have never didn't actually see the property until they walked across the threshold. And the reason for that is because they had trust in us as a brand to deliver against their expectation sufficient for them to sign their contracts in advance of actually seeing the rooms. Um, and, and, and that's an also important part of building a business, right? I mean, uh, yeah. you know, we, we, are, we are all focused on ensuring that in the world, people know us for who we are and what we do, not just as investors in the world, the property worlds, but also the customers particularly, uh, who, who then trust us. And so uh, in the last eight weeks, we've let 12 rooms in a market in Swansea where there are now 250 properties on the market, where last year there were 130, partly to do with you know students and then not turning up and of course lots of people turning around and going, oh my God, I, I, I can't let my student probably say, what do I do? Oh, I'll let it for young professionals. So suddenly the marketplace has got twice as many um, properties, twice as many rooms, and yet we still manage to maintain 0% voids and have sold 12 rooms in the last, uh, in the last eight, I... eight, eight, nine weeks, right? Because of the product, right? That, that's, that, that's my belief. Focus on that and you will delete, achieve your performance goals regardless of how tough the market appears to be. Can I ask you a question, Luke? You can, yeah. How much competition have you got? We have competition. Well, to me, I'm paranoid about competition. As far as I'm concerned, there's competition everywhere. You know, if you have a room and you rent a room in the city in which I'm operating, you're a comp com competitor. So my um, uh, increasingly over the last 18 months or so at the high end, because we do operate at the high end, as you know, Julian, um, there has been uh, more and more properties. In fact, uh, this comes back to aesthetic. Uh, the number of um, orange window, painted window, window reveals, um, uh, uh, he headboards made out of scaff, um, you know, window. You, you, I, it used to irritate me because it was like, guys, for Christ's sake, can't you get a few ideas of your own? Um, I thought you were going to say that about the staircase with the numbers up. The staircase, all that I've sort of got, stuff. I've got black, black, black ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were black seed, or someone else has uh, someone else has done that in Swansea. In fact, Julian. So, oh, well, I mean, the rea say. the reality is, whatever we do is visible, and if the only people focus on the aesthetic, they're missing the point. Mm -hmm. So, there are more people creating um, properties that look nicer for sure, and I'd like to say, therefore, we and I'm in mean collective, we have made a contribution to better quality property on the marketplace. We're driving, helping to drive standards up mm -hmm. a little. But if that's all you do, you miss the point. I mean, so how much competition the question is in reality, um, in reality how much competition? maybe four or five operators who who would uh who we who, who certainly who we operate uh, who we monitor um however um we keep making moves forward we keep innovating we keep evolving our products so i would like to think we stand in a competition that presently is is just us that's um, why you do so well that's why we do yeah. so well and i think that's another point I, I just wanted to make is that and and that um uh, um i can't remember who was saying it but um our product every, when you get a landlord that says there's too much the market's saturated what they're actually saying is we've got loads of competition that's doing the same as us yes but mm -hmm. i think once you start getting into really doing it right we don't actually have that much competition that's why we're at hundred percent and people that are complaining that they can't find tenants are pr complaining they can't find tenants because they've located themselves in a position in the market where they just have huge number of, of identical products around them that makes it difficult for them to sell. When you differentiate yourself, you don't have any competition. And you've got to be able to continually innovate. You do. You're constantly moving every single project, every, you know, you're learning on every single project, you know, you work, working out, you know, I, I, you know, I talked to Tom earlier about the fact that, you know, you learn about things that work and things that don't work on projects, things that cost too much, things you wouldn't do again. And as long as you're constantly innovating, you're constantly moving forwards, you're ahead of the market. If you stay still, then, then you'll fall behind. No, absolutely. So, uh, at least um, two, the two, people in this panel, me included, uh, have tech backgrounds. Um, I think if we look at how design looked in technology, uh, websites as an example, in the past 10, 20 years, design generally meant did it look pretty on a screen? 
think nowadays that has completely changed as businesses have realized that design is actually a user experience. And to me, yeah. that's the same evolution that's happening with the HMO to co-living. That, 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 when that happened, I remember when that happened, I set up my first marketing agency uh, when I did it myself. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a company called Clear Left, which was one of the pioneers in the UK of user experience. And they were in Brighton. And I remember when we set up our first agency, we, we moved into, into UX, so user experience. And it was all about the user. It was about the research. It was about everything else. As you say, at that point, there was a realization that making something look good, if you're skilled at what you do, is actually easy. It's easy to make something look good. But the usability, exactly as Julian mentioned earlier on, Steve, Steve Jobs said the same thing. It's not how it looks, it's how it works. And the rise of, the rise of user experience, which is what you referenced there, the van, was the big change that happened into the agency world, into the design world and the product world. And then it became all about how do you focus on the customer experience? How do you understand what the customer wanted? Because for a long time, design happened without that, without that element being focused on. I, I, it's a really important point. I, mean, I do have 30 odd years of been working in the world of technology and developing software applications. So share exactly your your, your views, man. But I, I think actually where we've reached now is it goes beyond function. It goes beyond form. It's, it's how it feels. And and that's a, a, a quite a difficult thing to, to to design for, or to excuse really what the focus of this particular session is to design for. But one of my objectives is I want for someone who decides to visit our property, when they step over the threshold, they don't necessarily know why, but in 30 seconds, it feels right. Huh. And 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 if you think about all the time when you've bought a house at some point in your in your lives in our lives right almost certainly we'd have walked across we'd have viewed tons of them but then one you'd have walked in and in thirty seconds you knew it was the right place and you wouldn't necessarily be able to articulate or define why so I think we sort of moved almost onto the point where where it is, is experiential but it is all about how it feels mm -hmm. I mean Julian was referring to it earlier in the conversation we were having before about living in one of his own properties about the storage all the things that are important to him and the way he manages um, the and I say uh, the units that he creates is that actually if you think about it, it's how it feels. People will stay longer because it feels good. You're designing uh, for emotion. You're designing for another sense. You're designing for that that that, that additional sense of of enjoyment and um, experience within within them. I say, Dieter Rams, who is probably one of my uh, designer that I have really uh, got a lot of inspiration from, created the, this ten principles of good design. And the one that gave me the hardest time to work out what it meant was good design is aesthetic. What does aesthetic mean? Um, and when I've analysed that principle, good design is aesthetic, it means to me the culmination of all the parts together and what, how that makes you feel. So, for example, when you buy a new car and the door clunks beautifully and the, the knobs move beautifully and the feel of the materials and everything else, it's the, the feeling it gives you when you use the product. Um, and it is one of the principles of design. I think it's, it is the hardest one to nail down, actually, the feel, the experience. But it is one of the principles of design, I believe. Just tapping into what Luke just said, actually, just um, on the exper experiential. Um, many, many years ago in the agency world, the, there would be a lot of work that we would do, which would be either, which would be effectively under the category of experiential. It would use, you know, you would work outside, you would work in with products, you would design an experience, you use technology, you would use various things for people to interact. And that world of experiential marketing is a really interesting area because it affects people's emotions. And, and just as, as Luke mentioned there, you know, there is so much more that happens in the space, which is under that category of experiential, where you are affecting people's emotions. And, and there's a lot of things we can do within co-living and experiment with, which have a big impact on that. I quite because like the idea that design is like, good design is like 99% invisible. Well, that, that's, a really, that's a really good point. It's also um, uh, making sure that you don't do things that irritate. Because, of course, everything that is wrong, whether it's, you know, say, Julian's case, a lack of storage, which is you know, a really important point. If that isn't there, it, it looks great initially, but then it doesn't follow through. So in other words, you haven't really completed the design um, uh, project properly because you haven't created the right feeling because there are things that are wrong about the space. 
as well as some things that are right. So actually eliminating some of the things that, that, that don't work. That's all, I suppose, part of the focus on innovation as well, not only creating new things that perhaps people haven't seen before, but also just for working hard relentlessly on eliminating those little things that actually cause people to have a negative experience. And getting that feedback loop in there as well, because every time you're putting new things out, as Luke mentioned there, you're getting that feedback loop of what works and what doesn't work and you know we we all of us we, we we get things wrong we get them wrong we get things wrong all the time and you know we try things there are certain things customers don't like and and and, and you've got to be able to change them and get that feedback loop back in so that when you're when you're going back through the design phase again you're 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 you're, you're iterating and you're you're changing based on what the customer is telling you that they are uh, they're in that they they like and don't like Right. Could we uh, move on to the next one? I mean, this, this is fascinating. I feel like uh, this discussion could just go on for hours. <laughs> um, but I know we've had quite a lot of people asking about COVID, which is the topical thing. Hopefully we won't be talking about it for much longer. But um, I'm interested if there has been any changes to your designs for 2021 looking forward as a result of COVID. And for me, just to specify this question a bit more, I don't really see this in the way of have you managed to get a social distancing within a house? I see it more as what changes have happened to the world as a result of COVID um, that going forward from now on will reflect or will need to be reflected in how co-living is designed for. I'll give you an interesting stat I was looking at. We do a lot of work in, in student world and kind of student co-living and um, I was looking at search data recently, and obviously there's, you know, there's two main concerns of, you know, popular concerns with COVID, isn't there? There's one is the kind of the hygiene and the social distancing and the, and the, you know, be on your own and don't come into contact with anybody. And the other is, my goodness me, I need social interaction because, you know, that's, it has a big impact on people's mental health. Um, and the search data shows in the student world that um, searches for studios um, are way down and searches for um, HMOs, you know, smaller community-based buildings are way up, you know, and that just says to me, you know, loud and clear, people are making a choice, people are prioritizing something, aren't they? And they are prioritizing being together, you know, they don't want to be locked up in their own little, you know, apartment box somewhere on their own. They don't want to be in a studio on their own. Um, They want to be with people, you know, and I think that's, you know that's uh, that's what that's what co living is about, isn't it? It's you know closing the name. It's you know it's, it's about you know, community and people. And people. Hundred percent agree with that, Tom, and that, that makes absolute eminent sense. And certainly our experience, the the one thing that we were I suppose set up to um, uh, was uh, all ours are on suite, so uh, we we the, no one has to share a bathroom. So one of the things that we have heard from others is that they're, they're less keen on sharing some of the more personal resources like you know like a bathroom might be I would say for us that hasn't necessitated a change it's just well we were doing that anyway because we felt that that was the right thing to do to give someone their private space their room um, and into which they can retreat which allows them to wash do the things they need to do and then come out for um, eating socializing and all the other fun things um, that that, uh, that that actually are, a properly run co-living unit regardless of its size in genders and um, in fact that we just uh, on the 2nd of January um, we were moving a whole bunch of youngsters in yes we were wearing masks doing all that sort of stuff but what was really really clear and very very obvious was every single one of them was there because they wanted to connect with others and make friends uh, and create a social environment that actually they've been lacking or missing for them for many many months and they were just keen to get back to it so I'm yeah, we, we call our little, uh, our seven to 20 bedroom units, little Higgies. Um, we don't see a need to fundamentally alter the design per se to cater for COVID. We just carry on doing the things we were doing before, only harder. Yeah, I mean, the important thing about COVID is COVID is very much an accelerator of change. You know, COVID came along, it was a black swan event. We didn't know that, you know, it came out of nowhere. It, you know, it, the the trends that it's affected were already trends that were there. They were there was they were already precursor trends. So going back to your question about how how the designs changed, I wouldn't say it's necessarily changed because if, if you were experimenting with this stuff, which you should have been done, doing anyway with the trends, then all it's done is accelerated it. So for example, people are valuing larger rooms. We've known for a long time that if you could have a larger room for your money, then you know it would be great because you have more space, more storage, everything else. So you know a trend towards slightly larger rooms 
because obviously, you know, those rooms always sell particularly well. Space to work from, you know, many years ago, people were starting to work one or two days a week from home. It was, it, the trend was already there. Now, obviously, the way we work has changed. Now you're more likely to work from home. Now, the research that we've done is that people, are, yeah, they work out of their bedroom, but they don't really want to work out of their bedroom if they can. They would love to have somewhere that is not their bedroom, but they can also work. Now, that doesn't mean we don't put the workstations in the rooms. We still do that. But we see that as that's for you doing your project time for your life and your time. But outside of that, the co-working and the spaces and the hot desking, that is where you can do your deep work, where you're outside of your room. So you get time away from the room. So it's accelerated that trend. That trend was already there. Like Luke said, we're not doing anything new. But what we are doing is we, we, we're accepting that this is really important now. Before, it was a bit of a niche fringe thing. Now it's really important. Private bathrooms, Luke mentioned, really important at the moment. People don't want to be sharing them. And finally, outdoor space. Outdoor space is very, very important. You know, the, you know, often overlooked by so many landlords. Within co-living, you know, really think about landscaping and, and utilising the outdoor space as an extension of the social space. Can I make a point? Because you did bring up on suites. I oh, know you, you love the subject. You don't like them. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I don't like them, but I do think <laughs> to say that they're necessary. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think is I think is incorrect. I have one en suite room in my portfolio, and that's the one with the greatest churn. My smallest rooms are the ones where I've had my tenants in for the longest and they don't have en suites. And actually my tenants, because I'm now living in my portfolio, mm-hmm. love taking baths. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if we so, have enough space, uh, maybe maybe over in Wales where Luke's doing his, the, some of the larger, bigger Victorian houses, maybe you get a bath in there as well, a higgy bath. Well, we, we, I'm, we, all, we, I'm we, saying, all I'm saying is, is the priority here um, is for to create a... I mean, I'm just going to give you a quote, okay? This is Terence Conran, and he said, Home is the heart of life. Home is where we feel at ease, where we belong. And I think, for me... To prioritize, I prioritize that as well. I think that's all about the well-being thing. But I do feel that to say every house has to have a, an ensuite, I think is personally, I think it's quite damaging to housing stock. Um, yeah, we're not saying. Say, but, uh, uh, hang on, Julian. I, I didn't say they had to. I just yeah. said we. Uh, chose, that, hang on, but Stuart we chose did. to. Uh, okay, I, I sorry, wasn't that, saying they have to. I shouldn't have said that. All our, we don't have all ensuites across everything. We have a majority. A majority of our stock has access to a private bathroom it's not always in the room in fact over 50 percent of our stock of bathrooms are off suites they are not in the rooms so is that an ensuite or is that not an ensuite it's a private bathroom that you have access to but it's not in your room right okay and no one else can use no one else can use right okay i get well, that it's sort of like an ensuite but i, I, I say to, yeah. go to your part julian i think i think it comes back to where we actually started the conversation you know we, what we're doing is we're designing for the market we serve yeah. and not everyone will want an ensuite I, I, yeah. absolutely and you know sometimes yeah. price comes into that as well the budget yeah. you know you, you you also have to break down your offering so that you can you can cater to different budgets and one of the yeah. things that's for sure uh, is a is an important part of putting in on suites is cost so yeah. so if you know if you want to address a different price point for example in your in your property um, or yeah, market absolutely or, market, or location or location so so no i or i yeah. my, my point is simply we've chosen and the and the, uh, the 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 end of the market at which we're operating um will pay a premium for having their own bathroom but no absolutely not and by the way we have just put our first bath into a claw foot bath into that particular property in uh, in in that room Stuart, in that property and um, it, it's record rents we achieved a record. So to be fair, it's the, the bathroom is as big as most normal um, uh, HMO rooms, to be honest. And it's it's a wet room and it's got separate shower and all that sort of stuff. It's an amazing room. We, but, we have noticed extra rent for, you know, when you get the oversized shower tray, the really big, the really big wide shower trays that, you know, that, that go in to get oversized bathrooms. They do, they do tend to attract um, a lot of interest. I mean, obviously, this is where the operations become so interesting because at the end of the day, if you're running operations and you're effectively a, a management uh, letting a, agent for co-living, then you get to see the front end of what sells, what doesn't sell, and what's sticky. The stuff that is sticky that takes that little bit extra work to, to rent, you see on the front, on the coal face, right at the front, what's what's renting and what, what's not. And, and, and Julian, you're right. You, you don't have to put, um, based on your market location, everything else, you don't have to put on sweeps in. 
but certainly in the area we operate in the southeast, we we our, our ensuite rooms are always the first to go. They're always the first to go, and and the the ones which share the rooms, they just they do go, but they just take a bit more work. So from my perspective, because I'm in, I think the first question was is is co living high end. So from my perspective, co-living is not high end, number one. And from my experience, yes, my uh, ensuite room always rents very quickly, but I have the highest churn on my ensuite room. Whereas my smaller rooms might take a little bit longer, but I have my tenants in there for ages. And I do think that, you know, the problem I do think in this industry is that people will just go, here's the template. This is what it has to have on suites. If it's an HMO, it has to have on suites. That's how it is. When I just think that my experience has been, no, it, it doesn't. There's so many different ways that you can you can create uh, a shared house. Um, and uh, it, it is different in different areas. It is different where property prices are different. And I just think that, um, it, it again, it's not. it doesn't necessarily have to be high end. It doesn't necessarily have to have on suite. Um, so I think that's the danger here. I think that it, yeah. I just want to make it clear that there are lots of different ways that you can do this and there's lots of different ways that you can do co-living. It doesn't always have to be high end. Mm -hmm. There's space in the market for lots of different co-living types um, and it's different everywhere. Yeah. And this and this is where the customer research comes into it. Mm. If you're running regular user research uh, customer, whether it's face to face, whether it's remote, whether it's surveys, if you're running that data, that data will tell you. That data will tell you what the customer wants, and like you say, there'll be areas where, actually, do you know what? Maybe maybe an ensuite is is not the uh, top priority, and it's further down the list. But actually, they value access to some some outside space. My other issue with this is that if you're doing commercially, if you're doing this commercially, uh, and I know you guys are probably very hot on maintenance and keeping things up to speed, but I think what I've, what a lot of people don't take into account is the is the cost of maintenance over several years and the consequences of actually turning a house into a commercial vehicle only because if you don't keep up on it if you don't maintain it and it drops in value because people aren't paying the rents or rooms are empty then if you've borrowed highly at it at the on the property at the beginning uh, and it loses value because you've not maintained it properly or because you've not built it properly it doesn't function right um, then you are going to have an asset or an, a, a portfolio that, in, say, in 10 years' time, you're stuck with or you, and you can't sell because it is what it is. You can't turn it back into a house anymore, and it's become degraded over time. So I think... Time. So uh, can, can we move... We started talking a little bit about demographics. I'd just like to go a little bit further there. Um, we've got a panel later on about co-living for over 50s, and I was just wondering if any of you lot had experienced any age increase of co-living? I know generally it's considered a young professional thing. And I think that's a myth. Um, I'm just wondering if you've had any experience in that area. Tom, do you want to go there? I can talk because I'm first-hand experience. Yeah, I'm 52. I'm living in an HMO. I'm, um, and uh, I'd say probably half of my tenants are over 30. And I've got quite a number that are over 40. Um, I've noticed a difference in the demographic from very young people to older people, definitely. Hasn't changed the design, but I've definitely seen a change in demographics and a lot more males than females. How about Higgy House? Has, has there been a... Well, it, yeah, it's for us, it's designed in, in the sense that we our strategy we refer to, it's not co-living, it's, it's through life social living. And, and our objective is to break down um, uh, life into discrete stages and for each stage to design product that meets that particular person or group of person's needs at that stage. So we have focused for the moment on is age based, right? So what, early 20s to uh, mid, mid to late 30s, principally for our for our co-living operation as, and, and products as it currently stands. But we are now focused on couples and how we can create some good couples. You know, logically, that's sort of your next possible stage um, you might think of couples with children. Uh, we get to Higgy in the middle, as I mentioned earlier, which is uh, divorcees in middle life, unfortunately. It's a, it's a consequence of the society in which we uh, live and, a, 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 and that half, I think it is these days of uh, all relationships and in, in, or marriages and in divorce. Well, that creates, a, to my mind, that creates an opportunity to create
report that, that, that addresses very specifically the needs of someone who is in that set of circumstances. Then you go on to you know, uh, seniors, we'll use the American term rather than the elderly. Um, I originally, my, I grew up in old people's home, by the way, so my, that was my parents' business you know, many, 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 many years ago from the age of about seven. Uh, I, I lived I lived in and around um, uh, an operating um, over the shop uh, 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 an old people's home. So the uh, approach that one might take clearly would need to be different. In fact, a lot of uh, in, there is some innovation going on up there anyway with villages and all sorts of funky stuff. So I, I don't view it as a young person's thing. I view it as we're in business. We have customers. Those customers have needs. And depending on what those needs are, we design a product that meets those needs. And if there is enough of those customers to justify you making the investment, you go to market. And so, so again, it's a, it's a different way of approaching or thinking about it, but it's fundamentally rooted in what problem am I seeking to solve? What customer am I seeking to serve? So it's not a young person's game. And our strategy, as I said, is through life, social living. We, we hope ultimately to manifest uh, what we're talking about in building what we call the Higgy Village. And the Higgy Village is an urban campus comprised of multiple buildings where each building is designed around the specific needs of a given life stage, but all buildings are connected together with amazing um, commoner resources designed to, to foster um, intergenerational community. So that, that um, simple, that simple I've got a, I've got a 20 year to. old photographer living in my house. I've got a 35 year old uh, guy that works in the NHS and I'm 52 and we're living in the same house yeah. and we all got on really, really well. Uh, I would, just from my experience, and I've got a house next door. I've got a forty-five-year-old couple, a couple, a guy who's twenty-five. My experience is that you. My experience is that everyone does get on. Um, it's not been a case of older people stay with older people, younger people stay with younger people. That's not been my experience. All, There's all a, all a all real all mix. All of our co-living is multi-generational. So we've got people from early 20s up to just probably mid, mid 50s, so probably 20, 52, I think it is. And we've got people where maybe the ones where there's people in the 50s, it's from 30 to 50. So we've kind of gone for multi-generational and we did it as an experiment and we had really good feedback and people, people liked it. So we've carried on doing it. But exactly as, as Luke tapped into there, we, we have our co-living operation, but we also have a portfolio of single lets. And um, what people don't usually see from the, the work that we do is our single lets are the same product. We still create the same kind of product and experience and operations for our single lets. And then when people reach that part of the, the life cycle, as, as Luke referred to, that they've settled down in a relationship, they're now in a couple, maybe they're, you know, we do have couple rooms, uh, but not very many of them. And then if they want their own private space, they can move into one of our singlets and that will take them from that part of the journey onwards. Because as Luke rightly identified, they are, they are a customer to the brand and the brand has a product for them for every stage of, of that process. Because ultimately when someone moves from one city or they move away or they come back or they move out to a new job and come back, they call you up and say, hey, what have you, you know, I'm just moving back to the area. Have you got something for me? They don't even go to the market. They just call you the brand and you you have a product suitable for them. I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier, Stuart, you know, about accelerants. And what we see is that there's a lot of a lot more mobility, um, you, you know, of people through, you know, different areas, different jobs over the short term. You know, we've certainly seen that through COVID. Um, <clears throat> lots of people worried, oh my God, you know, we're gonna lose tenants, people are gonna move out. Actually, what we saw is people need to be in their you know, doctors and nurses were an obvious one, lots of people moving around. Um, people saying, right, I need, you know, you know, X weeks or something like that. Um, so there's much more mobility, you know, and fluidity mm -hmm. in the marketplace. Um, and again, we get the same thing, Stuart. It's like people, oh, I'm coming back. Do you have anything for me? Um, goes to your brand point from earlier. So I think, again, I, I think COVID is just an accelerant of that trend. Um, you know, and, 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 and again, you know, the developers and the operators who are serving, you know, building a consistent brand and a consistent product and serving their customers, you know, will ride that out very well and are able to deal with that, you know, fluidity between different life stages. Because also they come, you know, they used to be, OK, this is the order of life stages. Well, now, yeah. you know, everything's jumbled up and people are doing things, you know, in all sorts of different times. Um, so, you know, being able to cater to that and respond to that. You know, great idea having the co-living and then, hey, well, if you want to go and have your own place and 
you know, we've got something for you there. So, and also some of the, when we've spoken to people in the older demographic about, you know, what's appealed to them and tried to get a bit of research back from them, there, there, was a, there is a number of them that have said that they wouldn't have considered traditional HMOs in the same way. Um, but when looking at co-living, the, you know, the access, the facilities, the environment, the whole community aspect to it, it's a lot more appealing to them. So it's, it may well be that the co-living has, has kind of broadened, it has broadened an appeal that, that, that maybe the traditional HMO wouldn't have been um, uh, as much of a choice, or at least it probably wouldn't have been an emotional choice, it would have been a functional choice. Whereas now you're kind of like broadening that more emotional choice to a wider demographic of, 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 of ages. I think it goes to Tom's point about the research he's referring to. We are social animals. Mm. We are social animals. We seek the company of others. We seek to, to uh, spend time with others of a like mind. We need it. And so we need it, absolutely. I, you know, it's, it's fundamentally important. I had a conversation with one of my tenants who was going through a very, very, very difficult divorce that was having an effect on his mental health. And unbeknownst to me, he's a bit of a drinker as well, but he's a nice guy and it's not, it doesn't really do him a problem. But he turned around to me, he was sitting outside in the garden uh, a few months back. And he said to me, Julian, if I wouldn't have moved into this house and had this friendship support, I'd mm -hmm. have killed myself if I'd have been Shit. on my own. Yeah. So that's the power of yeah. uh, having these shared experiences with people. It can literally save people's lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a really strong place to end this. Um, yeah. I think we should start to wrap up. Um, there is just one question. I don't know if someone can give a real quick answer. Um, I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll let you decide, but any top tips on how to minimise maintenance slash replacement costs from the panel? Invest in quality. That's, something, that's, yeah. something already, that's what yeah. your niche is, isn't it, Julian? You love Do it right. Durability. <laughs> yeah, Do it right. Dur Dur yeah you, you have to think about material. I'll just give you one example on suites again, okay? If you take uh, uh, a cross-section of properties that have been built uh, with en suites, how many do you think have got matte white paint on the ceilings in the en suite bathrooms? Mm. What percentage will have a, a matte white paint in the bathrooms? I'd say probably 98% of houses with en suites have got matte white paint in the bathrooms so the question is how long is that what matte white paint going to look good for before it starts getting black mold all over it and that en suite loses its value the answer is not very long so when you're looking at specifying a project you have to look very deeply into the material specification to make sure that everything you specify is fit for purpose so when you're putting in when you're specifying paints, for example, the choice of paints can have an effect on longevity. Um, so many different decisions can have an effect on longevity. The other thing, very simple thing, waste management in kitchens. Now, if you don't allow for decent waste management in the kitchen, it's not going to take very long for that kitchen to look like a total disaster, which is my point about en suites is people put in an en suite but then mess everything up so much that within about a, six months the house is going to look a total wreck and the en suite all the money spent on en suites is wasted there are so many things that you need to focus on when it comes to longevity but it's mainly to me looking at quality of materials and making sure you specify the right things so things don't break don't look crap within about six months builders if you leave it to builders, if you leave it to quantity surveyors, if you leave it to architects, it will not be specified right. So this is where design and understanding design, understanding materials is extremely important. And this is where the point about functionality and Steve Jobs saying it's not how it looks, it's how it works, it's important. So if you just focus on the aesthetics, you're going to miss everything when it comes to durability. That's, That's my opinion. Right. Um, well, thanks, everyone on the panel. Um, the next session that we've got coming up is the announcement of the UK Co-Living Association, which I won't uh, give any spoilers, but the things that we're talking about in terms of experience, in terms of trying to get co-living on the track that it could be and not the misunderstanding and the hijacking of the term. The association is there to try and help this and to try and move co-living along. So please join that session and, uh, and learn what it's about. And thanks everyone here, hopefully, the people watching have learned a lot. <clears throat> um, so yes, we'll end it there. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Thank guys. You. See Thank you, you later. Thank you very much.